Welcome, Dr. James Beck at Sports Card Insights. This uh, episode, outtakes with uh, the Pact of the Future crew and uh, John Newman on uh, Hobby Palooza. That was videoed. I'm just capturing off the, the audio. About 10 minutes worth was talking about the national, but a lot about grading with Tim and Ricky and Chad, as well as John. Enjoyed those guys. They make a lot of fun. I listen to their podcast. And there's a lot of great podcasts out there. So uh, this is not a substitute for listening to theirs. But for my listeners, I want to make sure I'm uh, building an audio record. Thanks, Pack to the Future crew and John Newman and uh, Mike Moynihan, Bench Clear Media, for setting up this hobby palooza. That was a lot of fun for uh, an off weekend. And thanks, sponsors, too. Tops, Panini, and Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Compsy.com and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. So that's a great big hobby. It's great. There's a lot of content to be created. <laughs> Very dynamic and uh, a lot of different ways to come at it. Again, enjoy your day. And here's the uh, conversation. And we'll see you again uh, tomorrow. There's a little bit of a different feeling that the uh, vendors are not as open to purchasing from the uh, respective buyers. Do you have any anticipation of, of how that's going to be? Do you think feel like there's going to be tension regarding everyone trying to sell and, and struggling to find someone to buy? Or is that not an issue when you get to something as big as the national? It's absolutely an issue, but the issue is not, they're not buying. They're not buying what the people want to sell or at the price they want. There's a correction in the prices that have gotten up when people are chasing other things. Dealers don't want to buy what was hot last month. They want to buy what's yeah. going to be hot next month. And sure. So they're smart, but collectors want to get full price for their cards. I think Wednesday and Thursday are going to be bonkers. Anything priced reasonably, maybe even not priced reasonably, but really rare stuff is going to be gone Wednesday and Thursday if it's priced reasonably. Mm -hmm. If you're still hanging around Friday, Saturday, Sunday with some cards, a dealer needs to be thinking, maybe I'm a little overpriced. Maybe I've got a price from February and today's price is, is lower if I want to right. sell it. Or they could just take it back home. And same thing, there may be some collectors slash investors who are going to wait till Sunday to get a good deal. Very dangerous, because if it's something really good, it's not going to be there on Sunday. But there'll be a lot of stuff there on Sunday. So, guys, it's not one blanket rule. The hobby has gotten back to where it used to be of not everything goes up every month. Some things go up, some things go down, and there's no substitute for education. When you go in, obviously you're going to buy some stuff. Do you have a game plan? Hey, I, I got like these three cards. I, I really got to leave here with, or you just fly by the seat of your pants and say, hey, I'm just going to look and if something catches my eye or what do you do? You guys are being so polite. I've listened to your podcast. You guys are being so reserved. You're, <laughs> you know, you're, you're just screaming at each other the other all, all the time. It's uh, nonstop. But for me, I used to be very structured, and I'm giving myself permission to be less structured and go to the show and just see. I have some appointments, but I, I'm not loaded up like I used to be, and I don't have any specific cards I've got to have. I'm not really there to, to sell, though. I'm there more just to buy interesting things. So. If I could make a list, that'd be less fun for me. I used to have a list. I don't want to have a list anymore. I want to be retired. I want to just <laughs> walk around and uh, see old friends. If I see something that's interesting, put it in a stack and make an offer to people that I've, I've dealt with at previous nationals. The last few nationals, I've had this kind of a free form, go through the dollar boxes and see friends. What's the one thing you in particular love to do at the national? A successful national will be three things. One is that I'll have some interesting, shorter conversations with people that I don't know as well, that I'll enjoy meeting and just hearing from them. Another category of old friends that I'll spend a little more time with, maybe people I'll have on my podcast as I bring my portable microphone. And third, I'm just going to buy some cards. The guys, I had decades where I couldn't really buy cards. I, we had a conflict of interest policy. So I, it was look, but don't touch. So now if I feel like buying something, I can, and nobody's going to, oh, he's buying that. No, I'm just having fun. So those are the three things, buying some cards, new friends, and old friends. I think that's a great approach. And I think the excitement that I'm hearing is that people just want to meet up, right? Post-COVID, get out there, have conversations again, shoot the breeze about cards and just have fun. We've been waiting to have fun with this hobby again for so long. And you know, I, I went, what, four years ago now to the one in Chicago, and I just really enjoyed browsing. It's overload, right? Like you said, the good stuff's you really got to target it Wednesday and Thursday. Like you want to be prepared to buy, like you need cash. Like anybody listening out there, you need cash. Forget PayPal, Venmo. You might not have cell reception, but I really enjoyed the time to browse. I was telling Chad, he was asking me about the VIP passes and if they were worth it or not. And I was like, it gives you that extra little window in the morning before things get crazy to actually just 
walk around and look without people being in your face. We've time to shop. So, so what do you think about PSA and BGS being there? What's going to be the reception there? I mean, positive, negative? Are they going to get overwhelmed right now? Um, Let's see. Emails? You said positive, yes. Negative, yes. Overwhelmed, yes. <laughs> I think it's all the above. If there's no line for PSA, because if you stand in line, that means you're paying 300 bucks a card or something like that. They're going to be disappointed, but there'll be people who are frustrated if there's a line at PSA or BGS, but it's a free world. They have a PR nightmare right now, all the grading companies, because it's just crazy. They can't keep up with demand, and even raising the prices is, is not quell the demand uh, enough. And they get this huge right. backlog, and they're going to be plugging away at the national, all of them, and there'll be people upset. Have you they seen the warehouse? I've seen the BGS uh, Back is back. it as scary as we all imagine? <laughs> well, the scariest thing is I have two cards in there, and I have no idea where they are. In there. They're definitely not getting special treatment. Michael Moynihan brought a graph out when I was on his show that some of his key cards have dropped down 30 40%. Some pushback in the chat room, which is good, that, that's healthy, that are saying that it's not that much. You got your finger on the pulse, Dr. Jim, especially on the vintage side. But how would you break that tie. I, I just have an opinion. <laughs> Basically, the, Mike's a savvy guy. And what we're finding out in the industry now with market movers and card ladder, even graded cards are no longer fungible. If you say, I've got a BGS 7 or a PSA 7 that I want to sell, and if you want to sell it for less, there's going to be suspicion that it's a weak 7. I think there's a need now if more than ever before, you're buying the card, not the holder. And some of this softness in the pricing is weak nines that are selling for less. A strong nine is way more than a weak nine in PSA, BGS, any of them. And so it's almost like you, not to grade the graders, but it's not sufficient to say, I've got a BGS eight and uh, the latest comps are this. If it's a, a strong eight that's pushing a nine, then you're going to get a lot more for it. You've seen that with some of these other services that are grading the graders and I appeal and all that. To me, again, education is the answer. If I were a vintage guy, I would not be selling cards in a lull when they are uh, strong for the grade. Let's put it that way. But if I'm going to take a haircut, why don't I take a haircut on a card that's a week seven? Right. Which really wouldn't be a haircut. So again, I'm probably overanalyzing it, but uh, Mike's a very savvy guy, and he's probably going to look at this as an opportunity to buy. And I know he agrees with me on buying the card, not the holder. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. You know, I'll see that in the Jordans that I look at. Like a PSA 9 is not just a PSA 9. I mean, the, the collectors know a centered 86 Fleer with great eye appeal is way better than the off-centered 9s. Really, you know, the nine. The card ladder especially has yeah. trouble with that because they're trying to report all yeah. those sales and they don't have a category for week nines. They have a category for each grading company. But so I think it's, gotten like, sophistic um, it's sophisticated now to where it matters. Would you say a website like Vintage Card Pricing becomes even more relevant now where they give you like the range on a PSA 7, for example, and like the trend for PSA 6, 5? I can just tell you one of the least popular things we did back in the day was have a price range for cards. People just want to know what the mm -hmm. price is. And, sure. and truly, there is a range. And I think that's helpful. Again, education is key. More information is better. So if a card's selling between 100 and 200, those are pretty different kinds of prices. And my guess mm -hmm. is, if you were able to scrutinize each sale and know the details behind it, you'd realize why there's such a big discrepancy. There is a way to account for eye appeal. Everybody does it. <laughs> I don't want to yeah. blow it for anybody, but that's coming because yeah. there is a way to do it. it. Whether it'll be universally accepted or whether it'll be one of the big grading companies that does this. But I did an episode about that. I appeal is going to be quantified and nu numerically yeah. rated. Really? Do you, you think that's the future that these grading companies will actually begin? They're not going to be replaced, but it's incomplete. Just to say it's a PSA mm -hmm. 9. In fact, even if it's a PSA 10, that's not even sufficient because what about a black label BGS? And so PSA 10 mm -hmm. is not a perfect card. It's a gem sure. mint card. And some are as perfect as I can see, and they don't even have a 9.5. It's coming, guys. <laughs> and so smart people are buying up strong 10, strong 9, strong 8s, and they're putting their weak 10s, weak 9s, weak 8s out into the float, and they're selling mm -hmm. for a little bit less, and that makes it look like prices are going down. I realize prices mm -hmm. are going down in some cases anyway, but that exacerbates it.
you're talking about how PWCC, you know, kind of rates their card when like Baker is now grading the grades on right. card. And Those two in people, particular. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. It's coming. It's It has to because it's more nuance. What? It, the money is so big, guys. It, you need more specificity. And that's not for every single card. It's just for some of these key cards. Is, is Beckett going to have a fifth subgrade, Dr. Jim, the four they have and then? Whatever they want to coin it, like I have people, no, how does a grading company? You don't need a need a you don't need a fifth uh, thing, John. Basically, what people are doing, they're put a premium on centering. Centering is the only one you can tell from a distance. If it's a nine surface or an eight point five surface, I dare you to figure out what the problem is unless you get a microscope <laughs> out. Now, if it's a seven corners, even that it's it means that there's a soft corner edges. You got to turn the card on the side to figure out it's got an edge problem. The preeminent grade to me is centering. Because it's the one yeah. thing you can tell from a distance. Some Market. people say, I don't want an off-centered card. And 70-30 is not okay. And that's my biggest fear when I get back these PSA 10s. I, I was a convert from BGS to PSA during the uh, last year. And that's my biggest fear going, switching over, is I really have no idea how strong of a 10 this is for what you indicated as far as the I, We've gotten back cards, Chad and I, multiple cards where one's rated higher than the other. But we would take the lower graded card. It looks more centered. It looks better overall. Well, there's even known wiggle room on centering that you can still submit and perhaps expect to get a 10 on centering, even though there's no subgrades on the slab. And that seems silly, just as you're talking. Like intuitively, where's the arbitrary cutoff that says, yeah, this is still going to be a 10. Yeah, I, I think your point is an excellent one. I really do. Obviously, BGS, what does the B stand for? Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that if people send their cards to BGS and they get a 9.5 with it with 10 centering, what's the chances they're going to crack that out, send it to PSA to get a PSA 10, which the market currently, in many cases, values higher? A 10 cent on every, everything else, a 9.5 or maybe a 9 on edges or something like that. There's a good chance that could be a PSA 10. Oh, yeah. Now, if you got a PSA 10, you're not going to crack that out unless you think you're going to get a, a black label or a, a BGS 10. And that's pretty dicey. That was a big part of the talk. Hey, crack out those 9.5s with the, the strong centering and go get you, your PSA 10 if you're going to sell it. Because on the market, it may have been turning for a better amount. Who's, to uh, me, yeah. it seems silly. To me, Who knows silly. what the future will hold? That's what it is right now. Yeah. I think a bunch of people are doing that. But see, if it's a 9.5 that has nine centering, that might get put in the pile to be for sale, and they might accept a lower offer for that because it's perceived as a greatly reduced chance to cross over. So yeah, no doubt it, is, it definitely was a cheat move, right, to avoid the maybe more scrutinized uh, BGS it's system. It's not cheating. Here. It's just gamifying. There's no crimes being committed. Correct. And I think that when I come to the word cheating, I think when we submitted it to PSA under that theory, you understand that. It's no better of a card. It's just simply you're getting a better sticker label on. Maybe to the true collector, BGS 9.5 is the, the better one to hold on to. That's all I'm saying. So it is what it is. 